see I got the bu button right, that's good. Uh, my name's Bill Boyce, I'm the manager of transportation electrification at SMUD. Um, currently much more focused on EV strategic planning and policy development, but I'll moderate your panel today. And we've got Damon Hanneman from uh, Southern California Edison, and then we have um, Hannah Goldsmith representing uh, SDG&E and PG&E today. Um, I can make comments on some of the stuff I do, but um, a lot of uh, direct work I do with the very few customers have transit buses in my uh, uh, service territory. I kind of have to keep a little bit customer proprietary for their benefit. But I um, want to talk just a little bit before we get going. There's kind of three classes of things utilities work with transit uh, operators and companies are. And, and the first one, obviously, is getting new service uh, established. Uh, a lot of the utilities um, directly work with the, the, the transit companies to figure out where electric service can come for um, electrification. Um, quite a few of the larger utilities also have various incentive programs available to help with that. Um, some of those are um, also approved at you know the different levels of um, different um, governing body jurisdictions and are in different uh, phases of all that. Um, second thing we do with most uh, transit companies is also really work on getting rates in place. Um, there's been a huge movement over about the last three years for utilities to start working on uh, new commercial EV rates to address um, the things that everybody scourges us about, which are called demand charges and things like that. How are we going to work that? And I think we'll hear some about that today. And lastly, um, all the utilities basically have consulting services where we can come in and help uh, customers figure out what their electricity profiles are, charging in particular. There's uh, technologies and operational things that we've learned that can help uh, reduce peak loads and reduce overall um, loads to help lower cost. So in general, those are the three big things, but we'll get into it a little bit more and some of the background of you know, where the utilities are motivated to really support transit electrification. And with that, I'll let uh, Damon get us going. Good morning. Afternoon, sorry about that. I was here this morning, a little deja vu, I guess. Uh, my name is Damon Hanneman, Southern California Edison. I'm a senior advisor for key accounts. I had my, my main role, and I didn't really do that this morning, is I have cities assigned to me. So I handle the municipal accounts for several cities, 22 of them to be exact in our service territory, ranging from the city of Long Beach down to Beverly Hills, Irvine, Santa Ana, Huntington Beach. Um, I also, um, what's keeping me really busy the last couple years now has been my transit agencies and my terminal operators in the port. So I not only have city municipal accounts, um, I have transit agencies and I have uh, the major cargo terminals, so the containerized cargo terminals in the port of Long Beach. So we have had a lot of efforts um, in the port over the year for electrification, starting with cold ironing. And if you're not familiar with that, it's pretty much shore power for the, the transit ships that come to call upon the, the terminals. Um, they have to plug in, a certain percentage has to plug in. Um, to the grid and um, turn their generators off. And so I've been a part of that for the last six years. And then um, City of Long Beach, I mean, uh, Long Beach Transit. That's really what got me involved with um, transit agencies in terms of um, working with them on electrification efforts. The, they came to me five years ago with their plans and we were successful in um, essentially constructing, and not through the program I'm gonna tell you, but essentially constructing um, a service to feed up to 40 buses at this time at about 80 kW per charging unit per bus. Um, that's what we, we built out to. And so that's kind of in their long-term, well, medium-term plans. And now we're talking about what's gonna happen after those 40 buses are adopted and we're working on those plans right now. But I am here to talk about the Charge Ready Transport Program, which it does have a component um, tied into it for transit. And why is Edison doing this? Um, Governor Brown executed uh, uh, B4818, increasing the state's target to zero, emission, to zero emission vehicles to 5 million by 2030. That's one driver. Um, it's in line, with, uh, in line with the state's effort. SCE is a wide ranging plan with, uh, has a wide ranging plan with the CPC for expanding electric transportation within its service area. That's Senate Bill 350. 
Um, Senate Bill 350 mandated that the investor-owned utilities come up with plans to help stimulate the um, transportation electrification market. Um, so our plan is essentially by 2030 to get uh, 7 million um, uh, light trucks and cars enabled in our um, service territory. Um, we want to have 180,000 vehicles total, 15% of medium trucks, and 22,000 heavy-duty trucks. So we have programs now for every level of that. Um, another, another big issue is uh, DAC. Um, this is um, just a picture of the LA Basin. Um, we serve most of the LA Basin except for LA City proper, and the majority of our service territory, um, we have disadvantaged communities. So that's a big push for us to help stimulate the transportation electrification market, and I know the state's in line with that also. So the Charge Ready Transit program um, has uh, been approved. Um, the program will roll out in late Q2, early Q3 of this year. Um, it's been approved for $356 million. Um, the goal is to um, um, electrify 870 sites and a total of 8,500 um, medium and heavy duty vehicles. Um, we'll be offering rebates to transit and school bus operators in disadvantaged communities, rebates for the charging units themselves. Um, at least out of that, the target is a minimum of 15% of the, of, the, of the budget will be spent on um, transit agencies. 10% will be spent on forklifts, 25% ports and warehouses, and 40% of the infrastructure budget should, is uh, intended to serve in disadvantaged communities. SC, the program in, 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 at a high level, will deploy make-ready infrastructure um, to some sort of interconnection point. We'll partner with the end user on what that means. Um, is it up to the charging units, or is it up to a uh, panel? Is it up to some main sort of switch gear that the customer wants to own and operate? Um, we'll, uh, we'll work with the customer on that effort to make the project essentially work for them. Um, they can, uh, we, we don't have a list of approved charging equipment yet, but we're developing it. So we will have some sort of approved, approved uh, list, and that'll be more specific towards rebates, I believe, for um, the transit agencies. So we'll have to come up with some plan and identify manufacturers and models that meet requirements. I think the end, the end use there is that we wanna have some sort of communication with that in terms of that system being able to receive demand response signals through our DRAS system, our demand response automated system, which is a internet-based system that sends signals out to customers who are participating in programs and have enabled technology to essentially um, identify that we're having a, that we're gonna have an event, some sort of demand response event. Um, the system can go into on a, uh, an automatic mode or it can be overrun. There's all sorts of different ideas here. Uh, we don't wanna actually control the equipment. We just want the equipment to get the signal um, that we're having events. Um, there is a option for customer ownership within our program on the customer side of the infrastructure. So um, as I discussed this morning, um, the program was really intended for Edison or the utility to not only do all the civil and utility work on the loads on the, on the utility side of the meter, but on the load side, we're gonna be doing the civil and infrastructure work up to those what we call make ready positions. Um, that's something that is new for the utility to get involved on the customer side of the meter. Um, and I did mention the charging crimp for, for that. So this is an example of make ready infrastructure. Um, everywhere in, I guess that's an orange color, um, is what Edison would be responsible for. Now, not only are we gonna be responsible for installing this, this equipment, we'd also be responsible for maintaining it. So as we do our normal system, on the customer side of the meter, we would be responsible for maintaining that equipment in terms of the, the uh, conductors and panels and switches. So um, that's essentially you know, another benefit for people to have us do these types of projects. Um, it wouldn't just, our responsibility really wouldn't just stop at the meter or the transformation before the meter. Um, it would go on the other side. Um, this is more of an example of a centralized DC power distribution system that um, a lot of providers are gonna be offering to customers like yourself. Uh, we'll install the service, the meter, and a panel, and then we'll have some sort of main disconnect to the, um, to the customer side's equipment. Um, at that point, it would be up to your provider you contract with um, uh, and the, for the charging infrastructure to handle that equipment. 
uh, I brought this into play because we, we do want to make sure that um, uh, there's a few things that the customers need to be aware of. They must own or lease um, the property um, and must be the customer of record for that site. Um, if, you, if you don't own or lease the property, if you don't own the property and you lease it, then we need to come into an agreement with the owner of the property for some sort of easements or access rights or, pro or um, licensing rights because we do need to have access to all of that equipment on the other side of the, of the customer's meter. Um, it, it must, we're gonna do an evaluation. Um, we're gonna have staff out there evaluating. It's not, if it's not myself, for some of my assigned customers, I have counterparts who um, have some of the transit agencies. We will come out and do a site assessment to see if what would it need to take to get the appropriate power there. Um, we can't guarantee that every site will be selected um, to have, be a part of the program. If you're in a very remote location and you need a lot of power, there might be out of, there might be costs that would financially essentially pull you away from the program. Um, I did I mention the signed grant easement. Uh, you must procure at least two EV vehicles or or convert at least two diesel electric vehicles. I think that's, that's pretty much a mute point here. Um, the the uh, vehicle acquisition plan, that's key. That is how we're going to plan for the future. So we need to understand how many vehicles you're going to convert over how much of a time span in order for us to put the appropriate um, facilities in to support your plan. Uh, you must be on um, an EV rate. Um, you must have proof of purchase of EVSV equipment. So during the process of the construction, you have to enter into an agreement with a provider. We're just not gonna build the infrastructure and then wait for you to sign a contract with a electric vehicle service equipment or a charging equipment provider. Um, you must be in that process of procuring that. And I think that makes sense on the reasons why. The stations must be operational for at least 10 years. Um, and you must provide uh, charging data for at least five years um, to the utility. We gotta see I mean, we're gonna have meter information, but we also wanna see the charging information also. And so there'll be some sort of agreement to, pro to provide that information to us. Um, you can combine on-site load management technologies to EV charging, um, to the EV charging equipment or process, including solar energy storage and or vehicle grid capabilities. That's important. We want you to look into other um, distributive energy resources on these accounts or on these services. These are gonna be separate services than what's serving your buildings. We're gonna put a separate meter out there, a separate service, um, so we will you know, allow, we do um, encourage you to essentially have a PV with energy storage or other type of distributive energy resources on that circuit. This is the big one right now. So, um, rates for EV adoption, available in March. Um, we're pending, it says pending CPUC approval at the bottom, but the CPUC has approved it. Um, there will be no demand charges for the first five years. Demand charges will slowly be phased in the years six through 10, and existing EV counts will have demand neutralization grandfathered into perpetuity. So if you already have, if you're already on an EV rate, we'll allow that uh, demand neutralization to go into, um, into, into basically what it says, perpetuity. Um, we are encouraging off-peak charging. Our rates are changing. I don't know if it's for the other utilities, but I know ours are. Um, in March, time of use, our, our on-peak time of use is shifting from noon to six, Monday through Friday in the summer months, to four to nine at night. And that's occurring starting in March, um, but that actually doesn't go into effect, that time frame doesn't go into all summer months, which is the first month of June, or the first of June. Um, the cheapest time to charge in the future will be from eight in the morning to four in the afternoon. And that's, uh, that's a big drastic change for a lot of people, but that is um, due to the excess solar that we're seeing, it's a supply and demand issue. We have a lot of supply at utility level um, solar right now. So we have a ton of supply from 8 a.m. to 4 p.m. And so that's when we're gonna encourage you to use your power. It still will be cheaper after nine o'clock at night than the four to nine, but, the, but during the winter months from eight to four is gonna be called, we're adding a fourth component into our rates called the super off peak timeframe. And that super off peak is actually during the day, which is, which is very unusual. Um, we had four priority review projects as part of this transport program. Um, the projects include the, the Charge Ready Transit Bus Program. It's a no cost infrastructure to serve electric buses. That's what Antelope Valley, I mean Antelope Valley, Foothill Transit 
um, is participating in and what I'm involved in with um, Roland. Uh, we talked about that this morning. Um, we are offering a one-time rebate to offset the cost of charging equipment. Um, we have four uh, transit agencies participating and um, everything's moving forward and for I, out of the four, I just have the one which is Foothill Transit. We should have construction done in June. Port of Long Beach, we have two projects. We're converting nine rubber, tri nine rubber tire gantry cranes at one terminal. It says 24 here, but it's actually 12 um, existing. Uh, we're gonna build capacity to meet the requirement of all 12. Um, that is gonna take a significant amount of diesel out of operation. There are diesel, 1,000 horsepower diesel gen sets on each of these cranes and they run very, uh, they have a lot of run hours. And uh, we'll be converting those to a direct, essentially a direct connection, not battery storage. Um, the second is uh, to serve uh, 20 yard tractor stations at another terminal. Um, we're looking at innovative charging as part of that, uh, basically an automated charging system so labor will not be um, burdened with plugging in the vehicles when they come to, to a position. An automated system will be able to charge them so labor just pulls up and then they can walk away from the vehicle. Um, I'm bringing up Charge Ready Program. Um, the Charge Ready Program was a pilot that we've had. I'm bringing this up because um, transit agencies have other vehicles besides their buses. And this is the solution we have for those other vehicles. So with the Charge Ready Program, we just got authorized $22, $22 million in bridge funding until we get a decision from the CPUC on our final program, which will bring 50,000 charging uh, um, positions into our service territory. Um, I bring this up because other agencies, like I said, transit agencies are coming to me to find solutions for those ancillary vehicles that need level one or level two charging. Uh, very similar to the tra charge, -ready transit port, uh, charge Ready Transport Program, where we'll provide all the infrastructure necessary to that make ready position. Um, it, it also can be used for workplace vehicles. So if your employees are starting to adopt it, we can do that also. Um, charge Ready DC Fast Charge. Uh, basically, we're going to have four sites that will have DC fast charging, and these sites will be located in heavily dense residential areas where the, the residents don't have access to garages, a lot of multi-unit family dwellings in the area or something of that nature where they don't have access to install their own charging. We're going to put uh, uh, DC fast charging, charging in locations on private property like a, like a Vons or something or a Safeway or something like that. Um, additional programs that we're offering, we're ramping up our transportation electrification advisory services. Um, we'll be performing rate analysis for our customers who are interested, finding the optimum rates, performing fleet assessment service to calculate greenhouse gas reductions and potential low carbon fuel, um, uh, fuel credits, and support customer-led programs outside of the programs. Um, we also offer self-generation services um, for our customers. We've been doing this for years where we can do a non-biased economic study um, of any potential um, uh, pr uh, the customer side generation projects that you're looking at. We can take a look to see if the, the, the right numbers were used and so on. Strictly non-biased um, and we offer those services uh, to our customers now. And then the online energy management tool displays day of um, information. So it's helped you to main monitor the fuel consumption now essentially for your buses. And I think that's it. Yeah, we're going to hold off the questions to the end, and Hannah Goldsmith will now uh, be our presenter and, and cover PG&E and San Diego Gas and Electric. So while we're pulling that up, um, as Bill said, I'm Hannah Goldsmith. I'm the deputy director for the California Electric Transportation Coalition, which is a nonprofit trade association seeking to advance and accelerate transportation electrification. And our members include, as you might guess, utilities, um, as well as manufacturers of light, medium, and heavy duty zero emission vehicles and charging station providers and others. And so I'm gonna be presenting for PG&E and SDG&E today, and they regret that they couldn't be here, um, but there were some uh, difficult circumstances for both today. So um, for PG&E, I'm going to be summarizing both the EV fleet program that is most relevant for transit agencies and then also their new proposed rate. Um, so that's what this slide says. And so the EV fleet program and the rate are really designed to address the total cost of ownership for fleets. And so the EV fleet program addresses part of the total cost of ownership in terms of the infrastructure installation cost. And the rate proposal addresses uh, the fueling cost. 
So here are some of the main details of the EV fleet program. So similar to what Damon was talking about, and thank you for introducing pretty much every concept so I won't have to <laughs> explain it. Um, no, thank you, I appreciate that. So PG&E will also help install the make ready infrastructure for the charging of medium and heavy duty fleets. And their program is 236 million over five years, 700 plus sites supporting 6,500 new medium and heavy duty EVs. And this includes delivery, transit buses, forklifts, and other applications, but a minimum of 15% of this infrastructure budget is reserved for public transit. Um, and I'll get into more details, but this program would cover a significant portion of the infrastructure costs, design permitting, and construction from power pole to charger. And there are additional incentives for disadvantaged communities, school buses, and transit buses, and that includes a rebate on the charger on top of the infrastructure coverage. And there's some fine print here, and I think we'll be posting this, but it has to do with some of the eligibility criteria, and I'll also get into that on the other slides. So this is, oh good, the color shows up much better up there. So the, um, this is more detail about the EV fleet program. And so um, as Damon said, the Make Ready includes the electrical infrastructure up to, but not including the charging station. And so for customer owned infrastructure, it's an after the fact rebate and anyone who meets the eligibility criteria can apply for this. Um, for the other side here, which is on the right side of the chart, um, this would be PG&E owned infrastructure. So these are two different options of how a uh, fleet could go about taking advantage of this program. And um, for that, PG&E will determine which projects to support based on eligibility, the total budget, um, and how best to align with the transportation, electrification, and air quality goals, and so both cover uh, a significant portion of the infrastructure, and um, there's, it's a little smaller there. So for the customer-owned infrastructure, PG&E would provide a rebate up to 9,000, and it's based on how many electric buses there are, but capped at 80% of the project cost. And then in addition, because transit agencies are eligible to receive the rebate on the charging station, that is on top of this infrastructure rebate amount, and you can see there in the top little orange yep, chart, um, it's by kilowatt of the charger power up to 50% of the charger cost there. So in terms of um, eligibility and what PG&E would need from you to get started with this, uh, at, similar to Edison's program, the fleet would have to demonstrate procurement efforts of eligible vehicles and chargers. You'd have to demonstrate an electrification growth plan to appropriately size electrical connection. Um, there are data requirements related to the charger usage for a minimum of five years. These are, my understanding is they're not um, too crazy, most of them will be set up through the charger itself, so the data will be provided to pg and &E. and then there are some like annual sorts of reporting requirements like mileage and things like that. Um, and then the fleet would have to make a commitment to maintain the vehicles and chargers for a minimum of 10 years. And so um, I think this has been said during the symposium a few times, but uh, talk to your utility yesterday. <laughs> the website at the bottom here is one way to get in touch with PG&E if you're not already. And my understanding is that most of the transit agencies in PG&E's territory are already uh, deeply in touch with them, so that's great. But if you're not, there's a way to get in touch there, and I'll also put up um, staff information and so regarding the timeline for this program, pg and &E is already talking to customers during its pre-launch, but they intend to do the official launch in late February, early March with full steam ahead by the middle of 2019. Um, and then, let's see, oh, that's the right, okay, we'll stay here. So um, I'm gonna pre-anticipate this question because it has come up. Uh, yesterday and today, and so regarding the um, bankruptcy proceeding of PG&E, it's my understanding that in their proposed operating plan under their Chapter 11 filing, that these TE programs are included to continue operating. So um, staff at PG&E are still working with customers on these programs, answering questions, et cetera, so I wouldn't um, 
use that news as a reason to not reach out to them if you are. Okay, so let's get into their proposed EV rate. So, um, so for, in terms of timeline for PG&E's rate proposal for uh, commercial uh, customers, so this is beyond just medium and heavy duty, but this was filed in November and it's working its way through the CPUC process. So the tentative decision date is September, but um, could be sooner. And I have to make a disclaimer on this before I get into the details that this is a proposal and is not yet approved, which means the end result could be different from what I'm going to present. So um, long-term business decisions should not be made on this information. <laughs> so, so here we'll get into the rate, and uh, this is a new commercial EV rate, and it is proposed taking into account a lot of the um, information that the utilities have heard about the difficulties of demand charges and certainty with planning for fueling costs uh, for electric vehicles. And so this is intended to really address those issues, be a more affordable fuel cost, a simpler and easier to understand pricing structure and help with certainty and uh, budgeting out for fuel costs. So uh, this rate includes two divisions. One is the commercial EV small, and that applies to charging installations up to 100 kilowatts, and then commercial EV large, which is over 100 kilowatts. This would likely be most transit agencies, but there could be sites that are smaller. Um, and there are different options for secondary and primary voltage service, and I, most of you probably know what that means, but for um, secondary voltage, and that is likely to be the more common scenario, that means that PG&E owns the transformers and steps down the voltage to what the customer then uses. And for primary voltage, that means that the customer owns their own transformer and does that themselves. Okay. So this slide shows the uh, what this rate would look like, and it was proposed as a subscription style rate, which is pretty new <laughs> for uh, utility rate structures. And so this is similar to kind of a data plan for a cell phone, and the subscription rate is significantly lower than what demand charges are today. So uh, it helps lower utilization sites, which most are in the beginning, save considerably compared to current rates. And as an example, an equivalent demand charge on the current A10 rates would be three times higher than this. So um, customers can change their subscription level throughout the year if needed as well within the limits of um, the billing and customer service systems. And this slide details what that subscription rate is for the large uh, CEV rate, and that is $184 per 50 kilowatts of connected charging. But um, customers who have storage or other ways to manage their charging, like charging management systems, uh, could actually op opt for a lower subscription level based on that. And then if there's an overage for a certain month, uh, the customer would pay an overage charge, and that is uh, two times the subscription charge for each additional unit of subscription beyond what the customer signed up for. But I think it's important to note that pg e is proposing to have a three-month grace period uh, for customers so you can get used to how this works and make sure you're in the right category without being penalized if something happens. Um, and then the underlying rate here is a revised time of use rate and very similar to what Damon was talking about, that peak period is going to be happening between 4 and 10 p.m. And you can see that there, it's the orange block at 30, kilowatt, 30 cents kilowatt hour. And the cheapest period is between midnight and 4 p.m. with a super off-peak period from 9 a.m. to 2 p.m. where um, you can save a lot of money there. And so this is not seasonal. This would be the same rate all year long, uh, all the time for pg &E. Make sure I cover all my notes, okay. So this is an estimated um, bill savings for a sample site type. So what pg e did here was they modeled a representative kind of middle of the road and conservative scenario for each of these use cases. And the uh, orange there would be the gas or diesel price for that use case. And then the CEV rate is green. 
it's gray on my chart. <laughs> um, and then the other rate that you would have been on without this rate is blue. And so um, it shows how this much you would save, and pg and &E estimates that it's about a 20 to 40 percent reduction in costs compared to typical rates. And transit is the fourth from the left there, so that is pretty significant. And there is another chart um, that I can share with folks, and if these get posted, we'll make sure it's on there, but it uh, transfers this information into a cost per mile instead, which I think might be um, pretty useful for fleets, so happy to share that. Last chart, second to last chart, but the last chart has no content to share. Okay, so uh, this is the summary chart of pretty much everything that I just shared in terms of the rates, so peak, off-peak, super off-peak, and the subscription rates for the different categories. Um, there isn't much more to explain on here, but sometimes it's easier to see this in this format. And in the interest of time, so uh, this will be your contact at PG&E. If you're not already in touch with him, reach out to Dean. Uh, he knows a ton about all of this and will work with you on the EV fleet program and can also answer questions about the rate. Okay, thank you. I will do. <laughs> you. We still have San and, Diego. And now we'll do charts. San Diego, so I'll put my other hat on. Okay. So uh, San Diego Gas and Electric will be a little faster because they're um, still in the proposed stage. So um, we'll talk about their infrastructure proposed program. So this was proposed via, uh, it was first proposed in January 2018 and then uh, in November there was a multi-party settlement submitted to the CPUC and this would provide EV charging infrastructure to support a minimum of 3,000 medium and heavy duty vehicles, including transit buses, school buses, and other EVs. It's a minimum of 300 locations. It's also a five-year program, and a minimum of 10% of the budget will go to transit and school buses, and the program would, um, similar to PG&E, cover up to 80% of the make-ready cost for the infrastructure and then also there is an additional rebate there um, for the charging station cost up to 50%. The total amount of this settlement is 107 million. So um, this would support transit agencies and my understanding is that MTS and North County Transit are already in touch with stg &E and have been talking about this. And so um, hopefully you already know about it. So. Uh, the program is currently pending and awaiting CPUC action, so hopefully that will be soon. In terms of stg &E's rate plans, they are examining rate designs and options to um, accelerate transit bus and commercial EV fleet adoption. They held a workshop on this and solicited a lot of input um, and they have had several conversations with San Diego MTS regarding EV rates. So uh, SDG&E has committed to filing an EV rate within six months after approval of their infrastructure program settlement. So we should be seeing that um, in the first half of 2019. And here's a slide that um, details San Diego Gas and Electric's um, interactions so far with North County Transit and San Diego MTS. And so they've been um, in touch quite a bit and engaging on discussions uh, in how to support the transit agencies to comply with the innovative clean transit rule. And here's the contact information for Hannon at SDG &E. um, And so if you have any questions, please reach out to him. And that does it for our presentation. So round of applause now. <laughs> So we now have about uh, 10 minutes for questions from the audience and um, let you all have at it. Hi, Russell Bear from Newbie. Thank you for the information. Um, I had a question for Damon on a couple of the elements of your program. One was you mentioned 
um, you needed to be a qualified EVSE vendor. And then the, the second question was, how do you define transport? Is it defined by type vehicle type or what's how do they need to be? So the first one's a lot easier. Transport is you need to have the on and off road fleet. So um, it's like by GWVR or what, yeah, what's the metric? Um, it, uh, well, that's a good question. I don't know if it's by GWVR. It's going to be, it's going to be, um, well, my expertise are buses, trucks, and uh, and uh, transport on side fleets of uh, the port. So it's going to be heavy duty trucks, uh, forklifts is part of this transport program also. Um, but I'll have to get back to you on that because I don't know if there's a weight requirement or what's going to make that, what, what, what's going to qualify for that. Okay. I'll have to get back to you on that. And then the second one was being the preferred vendor. It looked like you needed to go through a process. Is that defined yet? No, so it's going to be established. It'll be an approved, process, uh, approved product list. And I believe that's for the rebates of the, of the, um, the EV charging uh, equipment. So that'll be for rebates for transit agencies. The process will be displayed. And I can get you in touch with the right people to get on that list. Okay, thanks. So give me your card at the end. Next question's over here. Hi, uh, Mark Montgomery again with Omnitrans. And for um, Southern California Edison, I was curious when you had mentioned you encourage some of the load management strategies such as solar and battery energy storage. What, does that also include the smart charging or charger management system? Yeah, you can, well, since you, since you will be consuming a considerable amount of load, then yes, it would be, you'd be handling load management on your side, so we would consider that. So um, we'd encourage you to have some sort of smart charging system that um, obviously keeps the, keeps you from charging inside those on-peak time frames, uh, but then also um, is smart with uh, the vehicles coming in and how much charge they need, they need a full charge right away and so on. So we'd be, we'd encourage you to do that. Good. The, um, the question that I have too is, so we, we are working on a bus acquisition, um, our, our program, and so far it doesn't look like we're going to need to start buying buses until 2024. Should we or should we not apply now when the program becomes available in second or third quarter? There's, would, would, would they hold it? <laughs> there's money now. Okay. <laughs> so the, I, I, would, I would assume that you'd want to look at getting involved now. Um, if Now, if you're not going to procure to 2024, which this is a five-year program, you might not be selected, but you can apply. Um, you know, I don't want you spinning your wheels though if, if, if you're not. So I would just engage your rep, whoever it is, now, start looking at your site, start getting the site evaluation. What if, where would we want to come in and provide infrastructure? Have those discussions, start developing that conceptual plan now, and then you can start making those decisions as you go along. Do we want to pull the trigger on an application now? Do we want to wait, so on? Does that make sense? Yes, thank you. Hi, I have a question. Donna DiMartino, San Joaquin RTD, pg e customer with an expired two-year waiver from demand charging. And so I am suffering with the demand rate right now, and it really is causing a problem for us operationally. And I wonder two things, Hannah. First of all, when might we expect to hear and receive the new rate plan that you mentioned? And then secondarily, would pg e consider what Southern California Edison, I think, is doing a five-year waiver, especially for those of us who are kind of caught in the middle. Yeah, so in terms of the, I didn't realize that was still on, um, the timeline. So this was, the tentative decision date is September, so I'm not exactly sure when that would mean the rate would go into effect. Um, but in terms of the demand charge waiver, this subscription style rate is intended to replace that. There are no demand charges, and the subscription charge is intended to be something much more certain that you can account for so that you don't get hit with demand charges because they don't exist. So um, it's a different style than Edison's rate, so there, there is no waiver component, but overall the operating costs are intended to be much more low uh, for fuel, and they're even below gas and diesel as how they're modeled. So I, I don't anticipate that the demand charge um, issue will continue once you can take advantage of the rate, of course. Right, yeah, besides the waiting period, yeah. I think the next question's middle back and then over here. So, uh, Hannah, the, 
Sun, Sunline Transit Agency. I'm Tommy Edwards. Uh, we're in the Coachella Valley. Uh, we have a local municipal power company, Imperial Irrigation District. Do you know if they're working on anything that, that we wouldn't know about? <laughs> Um, that's a good question. So both the Northern California Power Agency and the Southern California Public Power Authority are members of CALI-TC, so we engage with many of the smaller utilities through them, but off the top of my head, I could not, but I can give you my card and we could follow up. <laughs> Just to follow up, I interface with those two groups as well, and I nothing rattles around in my brain, but you know, certainly the contact information it can be given through Cal ETC. Ray. Hi, Ray Pingle, Sierra Club. I've got two questions. So one, Hannah, the, so this subscription demand charge pricing is really exciting to me. I mean, this seems like the holy grail that everyone's been looking for that allows the utility to recover their costs for building the, the size of the pipe, but also fairly uh, deals with uh, the peaky pricing uh, profile of a lot of transit agencies. So, uh, and I know this has not been approved yet, but do you have any sense, buzz amongst the PUC or other utilities where there, there might be interest in using this concept for the other utilities? And then my second question will be for Bill. Okay. Um, so I would defer to the other utilities to answer <laughs> that question. We're not um, super involved in the CPUC process. At Cal ETC, obviously, the utilities very much are. Um, but I don't know if... In terms of demand charges, uh, ours just got approved, so I don't see us modifying anything. I mean, the five years, uh, no demand charges, and then, then your six through 10 introducing, I mean, yep. that, seems, that seems to be the solution we're going for. Okay. And then, uh, Bill, my other question was, um, uh, on, we've been talking about the three IOUs that are 70 percent of the electricity in the state, but what about the publicly owned utilities? So how can SMUD, uh, uh, since it's not compelled, is my understanding from SB 350, quite so much, or is it? I don't know. So where are the the um, the, the publicly owned utilities in terms of doing similar kinds of programs for their customers? So we have aspects of SB 350 that kind of come into our being, but um, at SMUD, um, you know, our current, we just passed a new integrated resources plan that's calling for a lot of um, basically uh, greenhouse gas reduction in the community. Um, and that new IRP really has a lot more emphasis on transportation and building electrification. So that's really coming out of our board and their adoption of that IRP and then those governing um, uh, basically policies coming on down. So we do that and the importance of that is really setting aside resources to start making this happen. Um, you know, those resources are in the plan. Um, I, don't think that we have them fully formulized as much as what you saw with the uh, IOUs, but um, you know we're looking at more customized type uh, approaches uh, by the customers to meet the individual customer needs. Um, obviously, we don't have as many sheer quantity, so we're going to be trying to be more flexible with custom type activities. Um, I'm going to go back really quick. Um, you know, some of the other things I've seen for rates. Um, uh, Southern California Edison has a, a no demand charge for about five years and then it kicks in. I've seen other utilities where it graduates in over 10 years. It, instead of just having a, a total holiday, it kind of creeps in. But I will say uh, there's been quite a bit of buzz about the PG&E subscription service rate. Um, and I think you know, we'll see a lot more interest in that from other utilities across the country. I mean, it comes across my wire quite frequently. I think we have time for a very short question because we're only a 45 minute, uh, and here we go. There we go. Steve Claremont with the Center for Transportation and the Environment. Uh, Damon, this question is for you on the, the new EV rate schedules that you've published. Um, have you also published um, how demand is be going to be reintroduced over years, five through 10, and is uh, the lowest demand rate also between eight and 4 p.m.? 
I, I know I've seen the document. I don't know where it's published. It's not published in our tariffs right now, um, but we do have it um, in a format. We can get it to you. It is, it's supposed to be 25%, it's, and then it's going to creep up to 50, then 66, and so on. That's from what I remember. All right. And so, um, and just, I, I don't know if you can rec make a recommendation on, on the challenge of, a, of creating a 20-year plan on, these, on the uh, charging assets that people will be investing in. Um, because they shouldn't really be basing it on these super duper rates that are going in now. They really need to project themselves out for 20 years. And that's going to, so the rate structure is going to drive uh, behavior on whether they charge on route or charge depot. And those kind of decisions, 20 year decisions, need to be made kind of now. So I don't know if you have a recommendation how they navigate that pathway. Uh, crystal ball. I don't know. I don't have that. Um, yeah, I mean, there's other things that play into that too. Uh, you know, things can change in California. So who's their providers? You know, there could be another provider of, of energy. So those costs can change. Um, that's a tough question. You know, given about 20 years uh, is is pretty hard in California. So uh, I I would just say that that you know I think that and this is Damon that. That some a mix of both in depot and on route charging is probably going to be a solution for most customers, especially on the longest routes. And so, um, having that um, aspect or planning for that potentially at a you know an off depot location or something is something they should be looking at. Does that kind of answer your question? Yeah, it's going to be a mix of a lot. I think I think there's there's just no silver bullet right now. I don't think, and we're all trying to figure that out. Okay, we're at our time limit, so that wraps it up for today. Thank you very much for this session.